The sermon is entitled, Here Comes Jesus, Brace for Impact, based on Mark chapter 3, and knowing who we are is defined by Genesis chapter 3. I want to focus on a scripture that comes to us from the 15th chapter of Luke, where Jesus is accused of welcoming sinners and eating with them. It's not very often that I get the chance, but uh, in the past I've had the joy of watching an animated sitcom called Bless the Hearts on Fox, and this will end this month. It closes out its second season on Sunday, January, June 20th. And Bless the Hearts, H-A-R-T-S, is a comedy set in North Carolina with a single mom, Jenny, who is a waitress at a local diner called The Last Supper. And Jenny lives in a trailer park with her mother, Betty, and her clever and creative daughter, Violet, and her boyfriend, Wayne. And they are constantly trying to find ways to get rich quick, and these plans are often messed up by her mother's, Betty's gambling addiction. And at the diner, the last supper, Jenny wears an apron, which says, I survived the feeding of the multitudes buffet special. And there on the diner wall is a replica of da Vinci's famous painting, The Last Supper. And because Jesus is Jenny's BFF, you know, she's in the Bible Belt, she has a personal relationship with Jesus. Jesus, in her imagination, will come out of the Last Supper painting and sit there in a booth with Jenny and give her advice about her life. When her water is turned off, she asks Jesus, can you turn the wine that I'm drinking into water? Or she asks, uh, in another episode, she asks Jesus if it's okay to pray for money. And I like the idea of how they did this in this sitcom. It's refreshing to see Jesus respectfully portrayed uh, in a sitcom on TV. And even more, I like the idea of a Jesus who comes out and hangs out with normal people and is a conversation partner through normal, everyday life. Jesus doesn't fix all of Jenny's problems, but he is a companion along the way. It's nice to see Jesus cutting through all the chaos and noise and all the divisive culture wars that most of us are consumed with and just doing what Jesus always did best, which is just hanging out with people and eating with people just where they are, who they are. It reminds me of the scene in Mark chapter 3 where Jesus is trying to hang out with his family and have dinner, but there's so many people crowded around that they can't even eat. And Jesus just wants to hang out with everyday people, eating with sinners, people that no one else liked, and calling normal everyday people, people like you and me, to be apostles, to travel around with him and to learn his ways and to carry out his message. Jesus is doing so much good. He is uh, doing so much good to so many people. He's even casting out demons. And all these good things that Jesus was doing, believe it or not, they really disturbed people. Some people were saying that Jesus had gone out of his mind. Even uh, some of the people that were crowded around there wanted to see how could Jesus be doing all these things that he's doing? Where did he get this power? And then some of the religious leaders show up from Jerusalem. And any time you know that people come from the home office, you know you're really in trouble. And they cast uh, Jesus and accused him of being possessed by the devil, a demon Beelzebub. They suggested that Jesus is using Satan to cast out the demons. And so that's why Jesus goes off in this parable about, well, how can Satan cast out Satan? If a house is divided against itself, how can that house stand? Basically saying that you're, you're the ones who are crazy thinking this. But let's just stop there and consider for a moment the point that these people are making, the accusation against Jesus. Did you hear what they were saying? That Jesus 
who, when he was baptized, heard a voice from heaven saying, you are my son, the beloved. And Jesus, the one who called people to repent and believe the good news. And Jesus, the one who healed people like the leper and the paralytic and the man with the withered hand. Jesus, the one who cast out demons and proclaimed the good news of God. Jesus, who had just called 12 apostles to be his followers. This Jesus is now here in chapter 3, accused of being demon-possessed. That's right. Consider that for just a moment, that Jesus, the Messiah, the one sent from God, is being accused of being satanic. How could the people have gotten it so wrong? Of course, today we might use different language, but don't we do this to each other even yet today? When we, when we say, when we have people that say things that we don't like, don't we say that they're evil, pure evil? And this is how Jesus ended up on the cross, isn't it? He and his message were misunderstood and ignored and even rejected. He was a major threat. I mean, to have people come all the way from the home office in Jerusalem way out to the boondocks where Jesus was in Galilee, that meant he was being taken very seriously. This is something that we hear through all, throughout all the Gospels, isn't it? It happens time and time again. And even in the Gospel of Luke, when the religious leaders of the day, the people who should know better and be able to discern the movement of the Spirit, they approach Jesus and point their fingers at him in accusation and saying, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. And my friends, that was not a compliment. That was not something that people wanted uh, the Messiah to be doing. They, these people that made these accusations against Jesus, the religious leaders, the righteous people, they were very sincere in their beliefs. They had years of teaching and tradition to back them up. For it was understood according to the teachings of the time that if you associated with certain people, and especially if, if you ate with them, then you would become contaminated like they are. And so to remain holy, to remain pure, and, and holy just is, a, uh, is another way of saying to be set apart, to be, uh, to be holy would, is to be set apart so that when we think of God as being the one who is holy, then that means that God is not like anything else. God remains pure and is not tainted by any of the impurities that we deal with on a daily basis as humans. So the religious leaders, they had lots of traditions to back up their thinking when they accused Jesus of being satanic or of uh, welcoming sinners and eating with them. Because in order to remain holy, you were supposed to separate yourself from sinners, people who were considered to be spiritually unclean, those who maybe were blind or had leprosy or had issues with bleeding like the women at the, uh, in, in, chapter, in, in Mark that did that. And so this is why they accuse Jesus of going crazy, because he was not acting like a good Jew. He must have an evil spirit. That's the only explanation that they could come up with. And he certainly can't be doing all these things and healing people and casting out demons in the name of Yahweh. He must be demon-possessed. This is the scandal of Jesus. For several years now, I have followed the work of David Hayward, who is a former church pastor and now makes his living drawing cartoons and painting watercolors. You can follow him on social media by his name, Naked Pastor. Not naked in the sense that he's not wearing clothes, but more uh, spiritually naked, like perhaps Adam discovered himself to be in the Garden of Eden. You know, raw, emotionally vulnerable, and 
and willing to expose or deconstruct hateful and shaming religious beliefs. You know, he's doing the work kind of like Jesus did. And one of the naked pastors or David Hayward's most popular cartoons is called Eraser. And it's a drawing that you can see many people carrying these very large pencils around with them. And all the people are busy drawing boxes. And Jesus is in the cartoon also, and he is also carrying a pencil. But Jesus has his pencil turned upside down and is using the eraser end of the pencil to go behind the people and erase the boxes that they are drawing. The people drawing boxes are not pleased with Jesus. David Hayward, naked pastor, has formed around his art a remarkable community that he calls the Lasting Supper. And I often will read through the comments of his followers that on social media, and I'm often struck with how respectful and supported most everyone is. But of course, as you would expect, he too gets hate mail. He too, because of the perceived threat of his message of complete acceptance, he too is being accused of having Beelzebul. One such message came from Tony, and it read, stop this nonsense, repent, and believe the gospel. Garrett wrote, I urge you, run from this. And Mitch wrote, your cartoons are making the rounds, friend, because they're popular, not because they're biblical. My friends, the gospel is not what we think it is. Just like in the Bible, we have the gospel according to Matthew and Mark and Luke and John. None of them are complete in and of themselves. We need all four gospels to give us a more complete picture of the one gospel of Jesus. And likewise, there is a Jesus according to David. There's a Jesus according to Linda. There's a Jesus according to Stacy. There's a Jesus according to Jeff. But the real Jesus cannot be completely understood or controlled by any one of us or any one church. Presbyterian pastor Frederick Beekner wrote that all theology is autobiography. And what he means by that is that our notion of who God is, is always based on who we are. And who are we? Well, Reformed theology teaches us that we are fallible and prone to follow our own self-interest. This is the message of Genesis chapter 3, that we all live east of Eden. We have lost that intimate communion with God, as it was so beautifully described in the reading that they used to walk with God in the cool of the evening. So because of who we are, gospel, true gospel, for what it is in its true essence, will always be offensive to us. It will never fit into any of our boxes or meet our human expectations. Gospel is offensive to me. It's offensive to everyone who is here, if we're paying attention. The Confession of 1967, which is in the Presbyterian Book of Confessions, puts it this way. It says that the reconciling work of Jesus is the supreme crisis in the life of humans. And that's what Jesus was about. Reconciling the world back to God, back to the Garden of Eden. And that's why he healed the sick. And that's why he cast out demons. He was reclaiming humans back into communion with God and with one another. That's why Jesus welcomed sinners and ate with them. He was rebuilding the kingdom of God, a community where all of God's children belong. So if Jesus were here in bodily form today, 
I think Jesus would be hanging out in bars. I think that he would go up and talk to the youths at the community park who smoke pot out there. I think he would be still welcoming sinners and eating with them, sinners in quotes, right? So what, I think one of the reasons why we come to church, if we're honest, the reasons why we log on to Zoom, if we're honest, is that we need to be reminded of who we are. And let's remember who we are. We're all in the same boat. No one has a leg up on getting closer to God. We are all in need of redemption. What did Paul write? For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. It's good news, my friends. It's good news. It's okay to be a sinner because that's who we are. It's good news because it means that Jesus came for you. It's good news because that means that God is reaching out to you. And Jews, Jesus is doing it with mercy, not holding our sins against us, as Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians. So that's good news because it takes us off the hook. We don't have to worry about getting it right. We don't have to worry about doing the right thing. Messing up is okay. What you gonna do? We're only all human. It's not about being perfect. It's about being more human than we are. If getting into heaven were about merit, you know, about deserving, then your dog would get in, but you wouldn't, right? But that's okay. Religion is not about doing the right thing in order to please God. Let me say that again. Religion is not about doing the right thing in order to please God. Religion is about being reconciled to God, being reclaimed, redeemed, restored, back into who we are, back into the community, back into the Garden of Eden. This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Well, thanks be to God for that, because you know what that means. That means Jesus is coming over to your house for lunch today. So go home, set out an extra chair, set an extra place setting at the table, and get ready, because Jesus is on his way to come see you. Brace for impact.